Washington, and what was the local music scene like when you were growing up in terms of music? What your hometown would prefer as a mainstream music at that time? Well, my hometown is, is as I said, this very small town called Port Towns, and there was no music scene mm -hmm. there. Uh, there's a few local musicians, like really great local musicians who I learned from, studied with. Um, but there wasn't like a, a scene, like clubs and things like that. It's a town of like 5,000 people, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, there was a scene in Seattle, but I never really had the money or anything to go to Seattle. Or, you know, it wasn't really a practical thing. I couldn't drive to Seattle and stuff. It was, it's, it's a couple hours away, you mm -hmm. know. And, uh, and so the scene was like these summer workshops and then gigs. Like I would just play gigs. Like I played restaurant solo guitar gigs starting when I was about 13. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was sort of my job, you know. Um, I mean, my mom would have to drive me to the, to the gigs. Like, you know, I didn't, wasn't old enough to drive, but, um, but, uh, you know, it was just sort of, I had a, a great teacher named Michael Townsend and, uh, he, he taught me all kinds of stuff about different kinds of music, you know? And, and, uh, and so the scene was like studying, you know, it wasn't like, a lot of activity, like a lot of other people doing stuff. I played with a few older musicians who lived around there. Uh, there were no, there was nobody really my age. I mean, I had a few friends who were interested, but but nobody who was really like, um, probably trying to make a career mm. in that area, you know. Mm. Uh, but I was I was pretty pretty deeply interested in in, in um, jazz at that point from when I was about 12 or so until, you know, until I graduated from high school, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and so I just tried to play as much as possible. So a few, two or three times a week, I would probably play somewhere in a restaurant, you know. And uh, I studied guitar with Michael Townsend and another, uh, there was a guy who had gone to Berkeley and was kind of a bebop player named Chuck Easton. Mm -hmm. So he knew the tunes like he knew tunes like Moose the Mooch and and Confirmation and stuff like that. So he he showed me some of those things, and then um, and then I played. I like learning standards, so I played with some singers that were around and and um, and then uh, I learned music theory. There was a guy named Alex Fowler, a guy who lived in a cabin out in the woods and smoked. <laughs> You know, and so he would go. He had this like weird little music theory group, and we'd go out there to his place, and like he'd have this little chalkboard and talk about the circle of fifths and stuff like that. And and so, but I was always really interested in theory. I always like. I still like it a lot. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So so would you say that from the very beginning, you know, you were thinking, oh, you know, music has got these elements, rhythm, harmony, and melody, and you were practicing them separately, or did it start with applying them on songs, and then you try to analyze it backwards so in other words did you start playing tunes and then think about the, all these elements of music or you practice them separately to create one big picture no, i think i practice mostly rhythm mm -hmm. i don't didn't know much about i mean i learned melodies for tunes so i guess i studied melodies but i mean i didn't know much about harmony mm -hmm. definitely you know and 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 i couldn't really sight read um Cause I was just learning kind of by ear. And mm. I mean, I could read, I could sort of read, like I could figure it out, but I couldn't like look at a page and play off of the page. Mm. You know? So, um, so I would say my primary interest was, was in the rhythm, mm. you know, in terms of like getting a, a rhythm, rhythmic feel on the guitar, like, and, and then being able to play like in time and ha being able to play different kinds of tempos. And then, interested in in musicians who had rhythmic stuff happening like especially Thelonious Monk, Charlie Christian, um, and Sonny Rollins, you know, mm. uh, and uh, and you know, and then I was very interested in what is it what what are different kinds of feels. I remember being interested in that really early like why is something like laid back? Like I really like Dexter Gordon a lot. Mm. You know I was and Grant Green. And I was like, why? How do they make it feel like it's kind of like laid back? Like, what does that mean? You mm. know, and uh, 
and so I, I, I was always drawn to that sort of thing about how does it feel. And then as, as I got more educated with the music theory, I was able to work more on harmony. But I was never, I didn't, I didn't and still don't really play piano. Um, and so my knowledge of harmony was kind of like based on what I could do on the guitar yeah, and stuff. Guitar, yeah. yeah. What do you think was the most important moment or person or event in your education? Uh, early education? Early education, yeah. Oh, oh boy. Something Let's that see. you would say feels like a light bulb moment. You know, something suddenly clicked and you thought, okay, this is the right pathway. Could have been the way that you realized, oh, I really love jazz. I'm really into rhythm. And these guys are really casting light on really important stuff. Well, I think it, I, this was not a moment, but it was some, some process mm -hmm. where I realized, I think I was about 13 or so. And I realized, and I know I remember that it was on rhythm changes yeah. on, on on that form that I could that I could think of solos. I could just have that going in my head and just be improvising solos in my head, and nobody would even know about it. Like I could do that, and I could just have this sort of like. I could have this kind of going inside. Mm -hmm. And I could have this sort of secret uh, um, improvisation just always going, you know, so that I would never be bored or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Like, I could always do that. And I was like, wow, that's a really cool trick, you know. Like, that's a cool thing. I can practice, and I don't need to really be playing. It's not all from the instrument, you know. It's not yeah. all about the instrument. It's about figuring something out about in your mind the ability to improvise. And when I, when I realized that it was kind of, I mean, it sounds obvious, I guess, but, but there was a point when I realized like, Oh, improvisation is like something that you like, you think of an idea and then it comes out as opposed to like, you know, you're learning material or something yep, like that. Absolutely. You know? And so, uh, I guess I didn't really understand that. I think for a while I thought, Oh, people just learn, like solos and then they kind of they play stuff that they know but i didn't that whole idea of of um of just you could endlessly generate new things hmm. you know that that was you know when you're learning a language like you know you're learning french or something and there's a moment they say like when you start dreaming in that language yeah. you know When you say, okay, now you start to internalize that language and it's become a thing where you're not translating back and forth and all that stuff, you know. Um, and so there was a point where that where I got like that with with improvisation where it could be like, oh, I don't I don't have to think about what it is in terms of the form and the notes. I can mm. just kind of think of melodies and mm. they can come, mm. you know. So And I, I still, I mean, I'm still trying to do that, you know, uh, but that was, that was what got me going and still gets me going in terms of improvised music. Mm -hmm. The idea that you just don't, you know, don't ever run out of those things. Could you recommend any textbooks that everyone should have in their collection of instructional material? Oh, well, okay. Number one is the, the any edition of the Bach chorales. Okay, that's that's the main thing that I teach from mm -hmm. Bach chorales. Bach chorales. Um, and I teach that to teach sight reading, to teach harmony, to teach voice leading, mm -hmm. um, and and singing mm -hmm. and playing and singing at the same time. There's so many things you can do with them, mm -hmm. and they sound really good. And there's sort of a lot of them, so you don't really memorize them, you know. Mm. You know, there's usually like 371 corrals or 380 something or something like that. Mm. So, so for me, that's the number one thing that I've used practically mm. the years, you know. Um, and then, uh, I mean, in terms of guitar. Uh, 
I mean, I don't know. I guess the Advancing Guitarist, the Mick Goodrick book, is one that most people check out. Mm -hmm. uh, I did check that out, and I, I, I was really into that for a little while, and it was influential in my own book. Um, uh, so I would say that one. Um, I'm interested in some pretty weird stuff, too. Like, you know, I like stuff like Harry Parch's Genesis of a Music and... and you know, uh, oh, I have so many books. I'm trying to think. I don't want to. I want to make it practical, though. I mean, in terms of jazz, hmm. like, like books like Dizzy Gillespie, "To Be or Not to Bop." Mm -hmm. That's a very important one. Or the Coltrane book. It's called Coltrane on Coltrane. The stuff where it's just interviews yeah. of people, musicians, you know, or or um, hear me talking to you, you know that one or notes and tones the arthur taylor one i like all those types of books uh for really sort of getting a sense of the history of jazz hmm. um in terms of music theory you know uh i i go usually to stuff like uh oh well there's Like I like there's the there's there's uh, the Bach chorales and then there's sort of like you know the various treatises on harmony like the Rameau treatise on harmony and mm -hmm. there's like the Fuchs Gratis Ed Parnassum like I studied counterpoint kind of yeah. traditionally that stuff so so you know I like those things and in terms of but that's all kind of focused on harmony mm -hmm. you know and it's, there aren't really I haven't really come across a lot of great books dealing with rhythm, you know, mm. rhythm is something that I teach, uh, like my students and stuff like that, but it's mostly through like clapping and stuff like yep. that, you know? So, um, but I'm not a big, I gotta say, I'm not a big book reader in terms of like, uh, of, of learning about music. I'm more of a listener, mm. but, but, uh, um, I like the biographies and stuff like that for Thelonious Monk, Robin Kelly's Absolutely, biography. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, and then I like these, um, well, let's see here. I should go down and look at my bookshelf, but, uh, there's one, there's a, a book by Ernst Toke called the shaping forces of music. I remember liking that one. Hmm. There's one called, uh, Oh, there's those books. Like there's a book called, um, the harmonic experience. Mm-hmm. William Matthew, that's a good one. What or does inspire you to learn more about music and innovate its elements? Oftentimes, it's what people, other people are doing. Mm. You know, like I'm going out tonight to see some music. You know, I live in New York, so there's always a lot of stuff going on. There's like five concerts tonight that I'd like to see, but there's I can only go to one. Um, but it's, there's people are are always um, the most inspiration other people mm. are always the thing that, that that gets me moving mm. you know um i don't go out as often as i'd like to but oftentimes um where would, just, you, where would you go where would you go if you had a chance you know to go all five gigs where would you go oh what there's a friend of mine playing tonight at the jazz standard jazz uh robbie standard. coltrane with with david gilmore he's a guitar player who i really like mm. there's another guitar player I really like named Nels Klein who's playing at the Stone mm -hmm. uh, Jess Smith who's a great drummer there's uh, some friends of mine are playing at the Jazz Gallery mm. um, there's another friend of mine uh, playing uh, Ambrose at Commuser he's over at the Vanguard mm. uh, I'd to see that band but tonight's my only night this week to go out so I'm trying to figure it out <laughs> um, for, all those things are happening tonight you know. and those are, those are the kind of places I usually go to you know? alright yeah and which one is the winner for tonight? I don't know. <laughs> I have a meeting first with the record label, and then I'm going to go over there. Hmm. But, um, but yeah, it's uh, uh, going out to see things is one thing, and then also being involved in other people's projects. You hmm. know, like I have a group of people that I'm in their bands. You know, for a long time I was in Steve Coleman's band. Um, Right now, I'm in like a band with Amir El Safar, a trumpet player, a hmm. uh, pianist named Matt Mitchell, 
I uh, play a lot with a drummer named Dan Weiss. These are all people who are really thinking about some different types of stuff. And so when when I go to learn their music or record it or something like that, I have to really spend some time expanding what I can do, hmm. you know. Because a lot of times people hire me to do some sort of extended technique type of thing. Hmm. Something that that normally isn't of something that you get guitar players to do, hmm. you know. I don't know why, but that's that's the way it's. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what's happening. So, so what tricks are you, if you could describe, uh, let's say, a timeline of process making your compositions, then rehearsing with the band, taking it to the studio. Was it a matter uh, of a month, two months? Did you have something on your mind for the whole year, and then that was just your mental preparation for that? What was the physical physical preparation when you yeah. actually started to play? That's the right order. <laughs> yeah, go. You you can change any order if you like. It's just longer than that. I mean, my I I tend to put out a record about every three years. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the first step is research, mm -hmm. having a topic. Mm -hmm. You know, in this record, it was something about mythology. Yep. And and about archetypes and about stories and things like that um and about well the trickster is a is an archetype archetypal figure mm -hmm. and and so and then that's re non-musical research right mm -hmm. then musical research what are the sonic symbols that then go along with these other symbols mm -hmm. no how do they manifest How does this manifest as sound? This is a weird, it's a very weird area. Uh, but it's what I'm interested in is the mapping of one type of meaning and one type of system into another system. Mm -hmm. So if I'm talking about uh, something like Well, a lot of the, the a lot of the trickster thing has to do with 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 borders. Mm -hmm. What happens at the borders between worlds and between places? Mm -hmm. Going to the underworld or going to the spirit world or something like that. There's a border areas, and that's where these tricksters are. Mm -hmm. right? And and in the border, it's neither one thing or the other. It's not living or dead. It's not human or animal. Like mm. there's 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 a thing when you can't really tell what it is, mm. and so a lot of the things on that record are well, you could feel the beat this way, or the beat might be there. Mm. You might hear the harmony one way, but maybe it's another thing. And so it a lot of the record rhythmically and harmonically has to do with illusions, mm. and and trying to create an illusion where the first time you hear it, you might hear it this way, and then you might hear it a different way hmm. the next time. And and uh, and then there, is other, there are other things involved. There's a secondary thing. I was making these animals out of origami, and there was, uh, um, in terms of the forms, um, I was interested in this idea of the minimal... Uh, limita the, the limitation imposed by a... a Origami. Yeah, you know. they are one piece, right? You made it one. Of, is it one piece paper? Yeah, it's one piece of yeah. square paper. Yeah, everything has to be no cuts or anything. No cuts. So, so the all songs have to be that, like that. Hmm. So the, the songs are all regular things, like sixteen bars of four four, twelve hmm. bars of four four. It's all in four four, hmm. basically. I think there's one that's in three four, and but they're all like sixteen bars. 24 bars mm. of 4 four, but they're cut up in very unusual ways. But the basic container is that, mm. you know, and then it's folded, you know. Mm. And and in the, the, the connection between that is like, well, sometimes uh, you I draw on multiple things. Like I'll draw on, I'll draw on this idea of the story and the trickster and all this as a sort of symbolic direction. Mm. But then I need something more, more concrete to work with to make the actual, the data, mm. you know, the music. 
like the information. Yeah. So, so it can't just, I don't, I don't really want to just be like, Oh, this is the way I feel. And I write it. I want something like that's a little more specific, you know? So I have to put some kind of limitation in order to have, well, I'm a, I'm an advocate of the position that, that you achieve the greatest freedom through limitation. Hmm through working within certain limitations hmm. without any without any constraints a lot of times people just repeat themselves you know so but with constraints and limitations you're forced to do something that you might not otherwise do hmm. you know so so I that was kind of the idea on that record hmm. you know a lot of musicians you mentioned <laughs> a lot of musicians that you mentioned that you work with as a side man, uh, they actually they are on your record, and I wonder, you know, did you uh, present the music to them and then you had a couple of gigs and then you went to the recording studio or you had you went directly to the studio and started working from there? No, we did it over the course of one week. One week. And okay. I mean, I wrote all the music beforehand, but I wrote it. I know with these musicians, the best thing is to have something simple that hmm. they can use. So the trick was to find something simple, but the stuff doesn't really sound simple. Hmm. So it's, the parts are simple, but then the way that they're assembled hmm. is, is, is it, like the drummer and the bass player, like they're going to be best if I just teach it to them hmm. by ear, hmm. you know, and then maybe have some stuff written down. But I made sure that all the parts, like I wrote all the drum parts on the drums myself. Hmm. Like stuff that I could play on the drums, mm. you know, and the piano stuff I could play it on piano, and and the bass stuff I could play the bass. I mean, I could play the bass; it's not a big deal. But but um, and so then I know all the parts are playable mm. because I played them. Mm. So if I can play them, definitely they can play them, you know, because mm. I can really play those instruments. So uh, so if we start from there, then there's a lot of freedom uh, because the the parts are simple enough that they can then. And not be just concerned with executing the part over and over again. Hmm. Uh, but they have to be complex enough that they give a certain character to the tune. Hmm. So what, you mentioned that it was spread out over the whole one week. So what do you think was day one, day two, day three? Yeah, day one, day two, day three was rehearsing. Mm -hmm. Day four and day five, I think, was gigs. Mm -hmm. We do performances at the Jazz Gallery premiere. Mm -hmm. and, and we just did it as one whole piece, you mm -hmm. know. And then, uh, like, four times, you know, four sets. And then, uh, and then day six and seven in the studio. That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And we didn't even really need the seventh day. We did pretty much everything in one day. Mm -hmm. The seventh day, I sort of did some more stuff, but most of it was kind of first takes and stuff like that. And did you have everything done in System 2 recording studios? Yeah, they closed. They closed. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to record a uh, follow-up this summer with the same... Systems 2 is still operating as a as a as the engineers that used to work there, mm -hmm. but now they work with a different studio, a different space. Mm -hmm. but, Do you have any favorite studios that you use yourself or that you would be tempted to use now? Yeah, that's it. Systems too. I mean, Systems is awesome. I mean, I, there's a lot of great studios, but they've done all my records. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah. Yeah. If you had a chance to have a perfect student, what does a perfect student look like? Oh well, the perfect student doesn't. It's not about what skills they have. It's about what is their what is their attitude. Yeah, that's you know? let's talk about that attitude exactly. Yeah. Well. Um, Okay, so there's um, the way that I learned. I mean, I had a mentor in high school I studied with for like 10 years, you know, mm. maybe, maybe eight years. And then I had another mentor, Rodney Jones, who I studied with for over 10 years. Mm. You know, and I had another mentor, Steve Coleman, I was with for 10 years, mm. you know. And so I don't consider student-teacher relationships to be really – a short-term thing. I yeah. think they're really lifetime things. Mm -hmm. If you now, if you're aware of other musical traditions, like in Indian music, for example, yeah. 
you, you, your teacher is your teacher for your entire life until they until they're gone. You know, your guru and all that. You know. Now that doesn't exist so much here, but there are there are mentorships situations that happen. You know, older musicians hiring younger ones and all that. Um, but for me, I mean, I've had a lot of students now at this point. I teach in a university and all that. Um, and uh, a student has to, well, okay, so so they have to, if they want to improve, hmm. they, they have to be motivated to do it, and they have to be hungry, hmm. you know. So they have to be hungry for information and hungry for the desire to hear themselves improve. Hmm. Um, now, I've had some students um, who are more concerned with um, someone saying that they sound good and, uh, you know, and giving them a grade and stuff like that. I'm, I don't really care about that. Um, if, if I'm going to... If you're going to study with me, though, there are certain things that you have to be able to do. Otherwise, it will reflect badly on me. Mm -hmm. I study with, like, I don't want a student to go out there and be like, oh, I study with Miles Ogazaki and they can't play, right? Yeah. So so that's not so good. So you have to be able to hear. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to hear pitches, and you have to be able to hear rhythms, and you have to be able to play pitches, and you have to be able to play rhythms. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. Mm -hmm. That's about it, but that's a lot. Um, I don't care about sight reading. It's fine. It's good if you can sight read, but anybody can learn how to do that. Hmm. So, so the main the main thing is to be able to hear, hmm. to be able to react, and to be able to play pitches and rhythms properly. You know, hmm. and and uh, that's a lifelong study, and uh, and that's what I work on. With I mean, I just like, can you hear what I'm doing? Hmm. Can you do it? You know, repeat after me, that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So I, I, I teach in a fairly uh, straightforward way, but it's 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 about looking at someone and seeing well where do they want to go mm -hmm. first of all, and then what will they need in order to get there, and can I identify those things, and can I help them? Can I help them along? Mm -hmm. You know, and then. If I if I can identify some things, and I can sh can say okay, come back next time and be able to do this some very small task you know because mm -hmm. big things like well oh, I want you to learn you know I want you to learn all the Charlie Parker melodies it's too much you know but if I just say I just want you to learn you know just get that together you know mm -hmm. the the right type of phrasing on it you know then then that that gives somebody the, the feeling that they accomplished something you know mm. it's like, like making your bed theory of accomplishment you mm. know you just do small things to feel like you, you're moving along and those small things then add up you know but that takes time mm. you know so two three five lessons is not really going to it's not really going to make a lot of difference if somebody wants to study with me they usually need to study with me for a long time mm. because i don't I don't move very quickly. I move really slowly. What are the common mistakes and false assumptions that students make, in your opinion? Common mistakes. Ignoring fundamentals. Hmm. The most common. Because almost every student that comes to me comes to me for some sort of wanting to do some tricky stuff. Hmm. You know, I want to play an odd time signatures or I want to... I want to I want to play, you know, I want to deal with, you know, these crazy kind of forms and stuff like that. And they go, well, how are we doing on, you know, four bars, four, four and stuff? You know, how are we doing on the basic stuff, you know? And can you hear, it's, it goes back to the same thing. So mm -hmm. I, ignoring the fundamentals, practicing too fast, mm -hmm. trying to move too fast, not putting in enough repetition, mm -hmm. not being honest about, Not being honest about the holes in your game, hmm. ignoring the holes in your game, uh, playing the things that sound good. Hmm. You know, so those are those are. I mean, I'm I'm not listing what students. I'm also listing what I do. You know, it's basically like what what I, 
the things that I'm saying, I notice other people doing, but I notice I'm able to notice that because it's things that I've done and I've noticed that it just doesn't get results. Hmm. You know, so the things that get results are all the opposites of those things. Hmm. Practicing slowly, repeating things many times, um, trying to identify the holes in your game and address them. Hmm. Um, uh, trying to play the things that sound the worst, you know, uh, and repeat those until you fix them up, you know, um, all that stuff. You know. hmm. How well do you cope with stressful elements such as peer pressure, competition, and fear of being good enough and living up to your own expectations? Would you have any advice to musicians that are doubting themselves? Imagine you're back in the first year and you're thinking, oh, guy, you know, these guys in the fourth year, they are so amazing. Oh, look at this, look at that. Well, you're talking about two different things. One one is comparing yourself to others. Mm. And one is comparing yourself to your own expectations. Yep. Yeah. So those to me are two different things. Mm -hmm. One of them I think is not useful, mm. which is comparing yourself to others. Mm. And one of one of them is useful, which is having a certain expectation internally that you that you want to reach. Yeah. Now that expectation that you have internally, that can be the bar there can be set by what you see others doing. Sure. Mm. Like I see, you know, if I go see Ben Monder play, I'm like, wow, that's a high bar for like doing a certain thing on the guitar. Mm. You know, like. You know, whatever the picking thing he does, whatever. Yeah. You know, say, well, okay, now this, now that's, now I've, that that might be something I want to work towards. But is it working towards to do it like him? No, nah, I mean, it's, I'm not going to do it like him. You know, I'm going to do, I'm going to do something like that. You know, I want to have something, I want to do something that well. Hmm. You know, so I think, you know, um, like my first teacher in New York, Rodney Jones, it was like, okay. This is setting the bar for how to do how how I can do picking like right hand, you know. Yeah. And so, so I was like, I want to get my picking like that, hmm. which is basically like George Benson, hmm. you know. So I mean, it's a type of George Benson style, and and uh, and so I worked on that for a long time, you know, ten years probably, you know. Hmm. And 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 uh, and so that gave me something to aspire to, hmm. but it wasn't something to be intimidated by. Yeah. I mean, because it's like, you're not going to be as good as George Benson. It's mm. not going to happen. Mm. Well, in terms of sounding like George Benson, he's the best. Mm. That George Benson, Thelonious Monk is the best one to sound like Thelonious Monk, you know. Mm. I could out-monk Monk, you know, or whatever, you know. Mm. So, so, but what you do want to do is become the best version of your own self, mm. you know, and become the best manifestation of your own vision, you mm. know, that you can be. Well, it requires some clarity in your mind about what that is. If your goal is nebulous, then your direction is also nebulous, mm. you know. So uh, so they work together, but I don't think any of them are pressure. Mm. I don't think it's pressure. I think you, you're not, I mean, pressure is like, there's other things that are pressure. Like I have a mortgage or something, that's pressure. You know? <laughs> that's, somebody's going to take away your house, yeah. So, so. Uh, you know, I have kids, they need the food on the table, mm. all that. That's pressure. Mm. Uh, I'm not as good as I want to be or whatever. This isn't really pressure. This is like, that's just something. You, you do music because you're inspired by other musicians and you're inspired by what you think might be possible. Mm. Well, I think about it on an inspiration level, not on a, on a, on a, uh, on a level of intimidation. You know? Of course. Have you ever hurt your hands or shoulders, you know, your muscles? Oh, sure, yeah. And In fact, I hurt myself really badly, the worst ever, while I was doing this Monk project. Okay. I wrote an essay about it. I don't know if you ever saw it. It's on my website. No, I'll, I'll certainly check it out. Yeah, check it out. It's in like a little blog section. So, okay. Uh, well, could you tell me how, how, how did you treat that injury and what would be the advice to prevent that injury now when you see what happened? Yeah, well, uh, well, I created this injury by not taking breaks. Not um, taking breaks, yeah. And ignoring signs, like mm -hmm. ignoring the pain that was developing in my shoulder, you know, and this, and it just developed into a thing that spread throughout my back and mm -hmm. all this stuff. Um, and it's still there. Mm -hmm. it's, it hasn't gone away. And I can still feel the sign, but as soon as I feel the sign, now I stop. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
But yeah, you can get injured. You can get injured, and usually it's the result of of some excessive ignoring of the natural, you know, things that you should do, like get up and move around. I mean, you don't, you know, if you're people, people maybe feel pressured by these sort of um, stories, legends about oh. You know, uh, Charlie Parker would practice for 12 hours a day or what, blah, blah, blah. Nobody practices for 12 hours. I mean, you know, it's just hmm. nothing's happened after a couple hours, you know, hmm. like not, really, you know, I mean, if you practice focused, if you have focused practice for half an hour a day, you're hmm. going to be okay. Hmm. You know, you're going to make progress. You can be unfocused and practice for hours and get nothing done, you know, so, um, but if you if you go into every practice session and say, at the end of this session, I want to be able to do one thing that I wasn't able to do at the beginning. Hmm. That's your only goal. That's usually my goal. I'm just trying to figure out one thing. I'm like, okay, cool. You know, hmm. um, those things add up. You know, so it's so you injure yourself through some sort of excessively long um, situation, bad posture, too much computer. Not enough exercise, bad food, bad sleep, hmm. all those things, you know. And as you get older, I'm 44, this shit just gets worse. So <laughs> so it's like I really have to take care of myself, and I have to be physically strong. Hmm. See, I think a lot of people are too precious with their hands, you know. I like using my hands. I like building stuff. I like using tools and hammers. and hmm. I like using my hands. If you're very precious with your hands and, Oh, I got to wear gloves to wash the dishes and like all this stuff. I mean, I don't see how that really helps. You know, hmm. um, I think that, that your hands are, are tools. They need to be strong. You know, I do stuff like pull-ups and I do, yeah. I do run, you know, I just ran 10 miles just now, you know? Um, so, um, your whole body is connected. That's all I'm trying to say. Absolutely. Like, absolutely. So, so if you if you injure your hand, it's not necessarily because something's wrong with your hand. You know, it might be your back, it might be your whole posture. Hmm. And so what I tell students, I, I notice this now because I've been thinking about it more. Because I never used to get injured, but I would really abuse myself, and I would not sleep and all kinds of stuff. But now, um, I have all my students practice with a mirror, mm -hmm. and just put a full length mirror up. And look at yourself and see if you look like you're doing something like this or, you know, you've got, yeah, you got your shoulder up, you got your foot up on top of your other foot, like some sort of weird thing like that. Mm. Like I say, like, you should just be sitting both feet on the ground, straight, your, ne your neck straight, mm. your head back, not forward, not looking down at your hand, mm. you know. And this this position is terrible. Your head hanging over, looking at your hand. Don't look at your hands when you play. You know, mm. just look out like that and play. And and you and 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 then that's very easy, um, common sense mm. sort of advice. Mm. Just use a mirror and see if you look relaxed when you're playing. You should just look like you're, you know, sitting there, you know, w watching a movie or having a conversation or something. Any other kind of way, mm. you know. Because if you can be relaxed, you probably won't get injured. And you, the, the, the big benefit is that your playing then also sounds more relaxed. Hmm. Because you are actually relaxed in your whole body, hmm. you know. Now, speaking of playing, right, let's say your gear very briefly. Uh, you've got your Gibson, right? What type is it? Gibson is a, a, is a Charlie Christian. Hmm. Um, ES-175 from 1978. And you prefer this one? Do you have any other guitars in your collection? Oh, yeah. I have a lot. <laughs> I have one that I just got. Uh, they're on my website, actually. I have, like, a page for yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, if you want to see. But I have one. I really like the sound of this Charlie Christian pickup. It's a single coil. It's very it's very dry and brittle sound. Mm. You sound if you have mistakes, it makes them sound really terrible. Mm. So, so... So it makes you play very precisely and accurately. Mm. The trade-off is that it has a very expressive tone. You know, mm. it gets a lot out there. It doesn't cover things up. Like, Humbucker, to me, kind of covers a lot of stuff up. Yeah. Um, but this single-coil pickup, very bright, and 
you know, you have to you have to be careful because if you if you miss some notes, they just pop out. You mm. know, but but I like that sound, so I had a guy make uh, one for me on a Les Paul body, so it's easier to travel with. Yeah. A guitar maker named Daniel Slayman who lives in um, in The Hague in the Netherlands. Mm. And so I've been using that one lately. I'm going to use that for the next Trickster record. I use the, the I use the Gibson for the Monk stuff. Um, I have another custom made guitar that I use for like uh, uh, by a uh, maker named Lucas uh, Bartoccioli that that's a, a quarter tone guitar that I use for mm. for music where I have to play some quarter tones. Um, I have an old classical classical guitar was my first instrument, nylon string. Nylon string. So that was my really my first type of guitar I ever played. So I still really like to play that. I still play the same guitar I got in a in a garage sale when I was like 12 years old. Mm. You know, it's 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 all it's like a it's like a beach guitar. It's like it, but it, I've used it on all kinds of recordings and stuff. So, um, you know, when you're an amplifier, what kind of sound you're looking for? You know, let's say somebody plugs you into an amplifier. What is it that speaks to you? Just clean, just clean, clean and hmm. I just want to sound like the guitar, but louder. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> so I'm not trying to get any special sound. I just use I use a Fender Twin because everybody has one. Hmm. I know what settings to put on a Twin to get the sound that I like. Hmm. You know, uh, but um, I have that. I have this this one I got recently that I just play in the house. This is a uh, this is a 1927. Gibson. Oh, L amazing. L50. So this, this, this one's nice, you know, it's real loud. Okay, and do you, so you've got vintage instruments and the new instruments. So which ones do you prefer? I have some new ones. I have like some D'Angelico guitars and mm. stuff like that. But uh, but I, don't, I like the older stuff the most, you know. Mm -hmm. So. Wow. And did you know somebody that owned this guitar before and that's how he got it? Or this you just one? yeah, or did you walk into a shop and it happened to I walked into a shop and I traded in. I had another Charlie Christian that I wasn't playing, so I traded it for this one. Uh -huh. It's owned by a luthier named Tom Crandall mm. in New York. He's a great guitar. He he had this as his personal guitar, so it's set up really nice and everything. Hmm. Even though it's super, super old, but it's it's a uh, it's set up like a modern guitar. So. What is it that working artists should avoid doing or stay away from? Jumping on, uh, say the worst thing that I see happen is jumping on a bandwagon. Like, oh, this is what's popular now, so I should do a project like that. And now this is probably going to get me the next. You know, I need to like trying to further your career by trying to do what you think is popular that people are gonna like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> really no, you know, and, <laughs> and then it dissipates your, it dissipates your personal direction. You know, mm. so the the people like who I admire, like somebody like I don't know Henry Threadgill or mm. or or uh, you know, I mean on on that in that area or somebody like. In a totally different area, somebody like Benny Green or somebody is just somebody who just does a certain thing, mm. you know, and they just do that whole thing, and then they become known for doing that thing, you know. But if you do, a, if you try to be a jack of all trades, uh, it's it's very hard for people to know what it is that you do, you know. And I've I've been in that situation, you know. I played standards for a long time with with singers, and then I played much more experimental music. And I remember trying to uh, talk to a record label, you know, a while back. And I was like, you know, are you guys interested in this record? And they were like, yeah, it's cool. It's just that when people see your name, I think they don't know what it is that you do, really. Because I sort of do a lot of different stuff. Mm. And they don't know what they're going to get. You know what I mean? Absolutely, yeah. So, so, so I try to stay, stay in my lane now. Mm. You know, I try to, like, find a... Find an area where I'm best at. Mm. Do that thing, you know. And and I find that I may not work as much, but the quality of the things that I do is better, mm. you know. And and is more sort of focused and concentrated on the things that I that I 
that I'm, I'm good at. So people don't really hire me now because they need a guitar player. You know, mm-hmm. it's more like people will hire me if they want me personally to do something. Yep. You know? So, uh, so that, that's, that's a different, I mean, it's not for every musician because some musicians are just like, well, I just want to play. I just want to work. Like I want to be in a Broadway show or whatever. I just want to do the craft of playing the instrument. Mm-hmm. And that's fine too. You know, that's fine. Um, you know, my teacher, Rodney Jones would always say, well, you have the art and you have the craft, you know? So this craft thing is like, how, how useful are you mm-hmm. <laughs> as a musician? You know, how, um, what is your value, you know, in terms of your skill set? Mm-hmm. You know, so can you play, in, for example, as a guitar player, can you play in different styles? Can you read, you know? Mm-hmm. So if somebody, if you're going to go play on Saturday Night Live, can you deal with that? Mm-hmm. You know? Can you play in a Broadway show and deal with that and just jump into these situations? Can you go play with, you know, could you handle the gig with, or could you get on the stage with Herbie Hancock, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, in terms of skill set, what's your value? And then in terms of the art, what is your idea? What's your vision? You know, what do you personally bring to it? You know, and to, to him, those are two different things, mm. you know. Uh, the, you got to work on this craft thing in order to be competent, mm. you know. And then you have to work on the art thing in order to do anything meaningful, you know. Mm. Um, and so I somewhat agree with that. In my mind, they're kind of, they're pretty, they're kind of, I don't work on them separately, really. Hmm. I figure out the craft things that are necessary for me to be able to do the things that I want to keep, I want, that I'm hearing, hmm. you know? So, um, because I'm not really anymore trying to just play guitar styles, you know, I'm not so interested in that, you know? I mean, I teach them and I say, well, look, you got to be able to, I want to be able to hear some quarter notes, hmm. you know, and, and be able to just, just keep that beat, you know, but, hmm. but, um, but I, I don't I don't really get that, that's not really my main focus anymore. Hmm. You know? I'm I'm really glad that I asked you that question at also at the end, you know, because you gave me so many wonderful answers today, you know, Miles. You know, a lot of things that you know will benefit a lot of students and could be um uh an incredible tip, you know, to them. Uh how to get them set themselves up on the right studying path and having a right attitude at least open mind enough you know to explore that music to that level that you're talking about and other musicians also yeah i mean it's just it's just music i mean it's nothing to get upset about or the whole goal is to make things that are joyful and that people enjoy and that you know bring people together and you know it's like to me it's still like ritual like ritualistic like stuff you know Hmm. i'm not here to impress people or to do anything like that. I just want to make stuff that makes people like, you know, brings brings a little bit of happiness. Mm. You know? So, um, so you know, that's that's where it comes from. We can get lost in all the details and all the scales and all the tempos and all the things, but in the end, it's like, you know, well, there's a lot of different ways to get there. Mm. Green, Green have the chops of of you know, Jimmy Rainey or somebody, you know, mm. but he made his meaningful statement. Certainly. Mm. He just figured out a way to, you know, may, uh, to, to keep the, to do this sort of simple language and very, very, very effectively, you know? Mm. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Mark. All right. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>